Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we want to worship you. We believe we were created for that. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for the calling. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for being together at this time and worship you. May this hour of worship be a reflection of our love for you. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So welcome. Welcome to Vilmont Baptist Church. Worship. Uh, for those who are worshiping with us uh, through our streaming and TV ministries, we are so glad, honored, that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. And it is time to worship, isn't it? Speaking about time, I think time is a very interesting thing. Last Sunday we were here and we were saying, today is the last Sunday of the year. Now we are back here and we are saying, today is the first Sunday of the year. That thought took me to the book of Isaiah chapter 46, and it says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. Another translation says, Declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. That is our God. So as a church, as your brothers and sisters in Christ, we do not just wish you a happy new year. We Christians are not in search for happiness, but we do wish you, each one of you, each one of us, that this year, this new year of 2021, bring us to the foot of the cross, to the feet of Jesus. May we trust him more and more because he is the one who can tell the end from the beginning. Let us worship him. Our medley, worship medley, beginning with Jesus' name above all names.
closer to the TV, right, or the screen, so we can talk. Okay, uh, all of you, I know, I believe, will recognize the object that I have here with me, right? <laughs> I think you will, right? So, it is a crown. Beautiful crown, isn't it? Pastor Andrew, when you see the crown, what comes to your mind? A king. A king, yes. A king or a queen, right? So, would you like to be a king or a queen in real life? That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It fits, doesn't it? It does good. A king or a queen um, usually live, they live in a palace, right? A big fence palace. And they have a lot, a lot of money, jewelry, and they are uh, surrounded by servants, and those servants can get them anything they need or want. Everyone looks up to them, to the queen and queen king and admires them. Would you like to be treated like a queen or queen every day? To be in a big palace, be treated, whatever you want is right there in front of you. So today, I want to talk to you about a king. But it is a king who took off his crown. He chose not to wear a crown like that and gave up. This king I'm talking about, he gave up his throne to become a servant. And I have the word, word right here because I want you to see this word. I want you to think about what is a servant. Do you know what a servant is? Well... A servant is a person who serves others. A servant works for someone else. He serves others. Everything that person needs or wants, the servant does. Okay? The, and this king that I'm talking about has a name. We were celebrating his birthday the other day, a few days ago. His name is Jesus. I'm going to talk to you about the king servant, Jesus. The Bible tells us that, excuse me, Jesus put aside everything he had and made him, that everything that made him king 
and came to earth to become a servant. Jesus became a person who served others. When Jesus was on earth, he spent his life in service to others. But how did he do that, right? The Bible tells us. When we read the Bible, we learn that Jesus healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He was a friend to those who had no friends. Jesus never lived in a palace. He had no money, no silver or gold. He had no jewelry. And the only crown that Jesus uh, had while he was here on earth was not a crown like that, but it was a crown of thorns. If I were to ask you, if you want to be like Jesus, I bet most of you would say yes. But that isn't my question this morning. My question is, would you rather be a king or a servant? Boys and girls, Jesus chose to be a servant. So if we want to be like Jesus, we must choose to be a servant as well. So we must choose to live our lives thinking about other people first, then us. So let us go to him in prayer. Dear Jesus, Help us to follow your example. Help us to choose to love and to serve others. In your name we pray. Amen. And good morning to you, church. Certainly it is good for us to be together and unified in the power of the Holy Spirit. The psalmist speaks of such. In Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. So we are so grateful that you are worshiping with us this day. We do have a custom here at Viewmont, if this is your first time worshiping with us, and we express our faith and our confidence in God by lifting our hands together and boldly saying that God is good. All the time. And all the time. As we begin this new year, coming before Almighty God, let us do so in prayer, bowing before his throne. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Oh, good and holy, loving and just, merciful and eternal God, we come humbly this day. We come trembling. For we know that indeed we are not worthy to be in your presence. For you are far holier, far more worthy than we could ever imagine. And so we come, O oh God, trembling in healthy and holy fear, reverent before you. Knowing that it's in you and through you and by you that we live and move and have our being. For you have given life, temporal and eternal So, Father, we come to you this day knowing that it's only your presence that can give hope. We come this day knowing that it's only your heart that can give life. We know that it's only your hands, nail-pierced as they are, that can offer forgiveness. 
So we come, O oh God, this day acknowledging our own sinfulness. As we stand here on the precipice of a new year, we do so with a great awareness and awakening in our own souls of just how desperately we need you and how deep our sin goes. So, oh God, cleanse us and heal us and restore unto us the joy of your salvation. May the cross of Christ be the focal point of our souls, our lives. May it be the heartbeat of each and every day that we live. And may we seek nothing more than to stay near the cross. We plead, O oh God, the blood of Jesus over our sin, that indeed there may be forgiveness and restoration. And Father, we lift up the needs around us, the brokenness around us, the hurt around us, whatever it may be, physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, we bring it before you, O oh God, and we lay it at your feet, for we know that you love and you care. We know that you have carried these burdens. And we ask, O oh God, for the grace of the Holy Spirit to come and to shoulder these burdens for us, for we are not strong enough to carry them on our own, nor should we dare try. For it's not our shoulders that have hung upon the cross, but yours. So remind us, O oh God, of our calling to bring these needs and concerns to you and leave them at your feet and let you carry them. For, O oh God, the needs and the weights, the burdens and the concerns are many and deep and vast, and we plead the blood of Jesus over them, and we ask that the power of the resurrection of Christ would go forth and would break every chain in the name of Jesus, that death would be shattered this day in the name of Jesus, that strongholds would fall by the wayside in the name of Jesus. And that the resurrection power of Christ would raise up new life. That the old has gone and the new has come in the name of Jesus. For it's at that name that we tremble and we fall before you, O oh God. For indeed you are king. So hear us, we pray. We plead as we come before you in the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. In a world where cities crowd the land and each man wants a home Where people long for signs of hope And joy for some is gone Show me what I must do Show me where I must go Where I must go All of my tomorrows, Lord, 
I bring to you today all of my tomorrows, Lord. I gladly give away, giving of self and giving of love as you have given me. All of my tomorrows, Lord, I bring them now to Thee. In a world that strives for lasting peace and freedom for all men, where young men see truth and old men need a friend show me what I must do show me where I must go where I must go all of my Tomorrow's Lord, I bring to you today. All of my tomorrow's Lord, I gladly give away, giving of self and giving of love as you have given me. All of my tomorrows, Lord, I bring to you this day. In a world where people feel the hurt, I'll give my life for them. Where people love with them. Show me what I must do. Show me where I must go, where I must go. All of my tomorrows, Lord, I bring I gladly give away, giving of self and giving of love as you have given me. All of my tomorrows, Lord, I bring them now to thee. Tomorrow's Lord, I bring to you today. All of my tomorrow's Lord, I gladly. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Certainly, as Christ has taught us, whoever will come after Christ must deny themselves, take up a cross, and follow. 
where we give of ourselves, finding life in Christ Jesus. Turn with me, if you would, to Paul's letter to the Philippians this morning. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 5 through 11 this morning as we begin the new year, as we look ahead into this new year that is before us, we come to this powerful, powerful message in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Follow along in your copy of the scriptures. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself And became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus. Take a moment, pause, and say that name with me, Jesus. Let's say it together. Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. And now, O God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Rock, our Redeemer. She looked at me with tender eyes and such a childlike innocence. Tell me about God, she said. As tender and serious as anyone I had ever heard, tell me what God is like. Well, where do you begin to answer a question like that? How do you begin to answer a question like that? I guess, I guess, she figured that, well, since I'm a minister, I probably should know how to begin to answer that question, how to explain that to a child, your own child, But it kind of left me speechless for a moment. Where to begin? Suppose someone makes that same request of you. Tell me about God. What is God like? Where would you begin? What would you include? How can we ever, ever put into words the depth of glory and majesty, and holiness, and power, and love, and grace, and truth, and justice, and light, and life, and mercy of who God really is. After all, volumes upon volumes have been written through the centuries upon centuries about this very thing, who God is. Is And yet on page after page in the Holy Scriptures, we are pointed to the one who is all of that and more, who is complete and who is full. And still, how do we put all of that into a description that we can handle? You know, sometimes we can catch a glimpse of who God is and what God is like. A sunset, a laugh, a gentle breeze, a calming ocean wave that tosses to and fro. Glimpses like this are not bad. Sometimes we need a glimpse to be reminded of what God is like. Sometimes that's just what we needed. 
And sometimes a glimpse is all we can bear for who God is like. Last fall, we took time as a congregation on Sunday mornings to explore some of the various names of God scattered throughout the Scriptures. And we saw how these various names mentioned throughout the Old and the New Testament reveal a moment in history when humanity is granted a glimpse into the character and the person of God. Elohim and Yahweh and Jehovah Roy. We looked at some of these names of God and each week, We took those names and we connected them to the depth and the practice of the Lord's Prayer. And one of the aspects about all of that that I hope you can remember and have absorbed into your own soul is how this life of living, living and following God in faith, we come to know God deeper and deeper to know God more and more intimately, and to know that we are embarking on a journey of faith and trust. We saw together how God is the powerful one. God is the faithful one. God is the providing one. God is the healing one. God is the shepherding one. God is the with one. And there is so much more So much here about who God is that we cannot ever know it all. And because of the situation surrounding COVID-19, we were not able to fully wrap up that study and sermon series on the names of God and connecting them to the Lord's Prayer. So as we begin the new year, this is the perfect time to do so, to be reminded of who God is. Who is this one that we have dropped our nets to follow? This is not a theory. It is not an idea. It is not abstract and illustrative to look at who God is, to think of who God is. We must, church, look at Jesus, the complete fullness of God, the direct picture of God, our Father. A part of the final moments in the life and the ministry of Jesus, after he has shared his final meal with his disciples, he goes alone to pray. And John's gospel records this lengthy priestly-like prayer in John 17, where Jesus prays to God the Father and says these words, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. You know, that's exactly what Paul is getting at here in Philippians 2 overwhelmingly referred to as a Christ hymn. These verses in Philippians 2, we read just a moment ago, are a very early expression of the unique person and work of Jesus. It almost has a creedal flow to it, that this is something we could say as a statement of belief. These words in Philippians 2, are dripping with theological depth more than one sermon could ever explore. It takes a lifetime of unpacking what all of this is about. And you and I are invited on this journey to know God deeper and clearer. And with each step along the way, seeing our faith and our trust in God grow deeper and richer and fuller. I don't know about you, but I will tell you this about me. The more I walk with Christ Jesus, the more I realize how much I need Christ Jesus. The longer I walk with him, the more I realize just how desperately I need him and must trust him. 
Because Christ is the embodied presence of God as Emmanuel. We've just come through the season of Advent where we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We see that God is indeed with us here in Christ. And Paul instructs and even implores the Philippian congregation to take on the mindset of Christ, the attitude of Christ. Allow the life of Christ to become your life, he says. As you know, just like Rana, my dear wife, I grew up in the home of a pastor. I don't remember the first time I went to church. I really don't. I don't remember the first time I heard the name Jesus. I don't remember the first time I sang Amazing Grace. I don't remember the first time I heard the parable of the prodigal son. I don't remember the first time that the crossing of the Red Sea was painted into my mind's eye. But I do remember distinctly and vividly the first time I came across these words from Paul. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I remember the first time I came across those words. It was during a Bible study with my youth group when I was a teenager. We were sitting in the living room of a couple who helped lead and work with our youth group. And these words leapt off the page at me. And they hit me square between the eyes and deep in the heart. And the reason is because my father and I had been in conversation in the days leading up to that moment in that Bible study that was about my attitude. And we know how teenage attitudes can be, don't we? It stuck out to me. It called my attention It caused my heart even to skip a beat. For as Jesus said, quoting the Psalms and the Proverbs, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. To follow Jesus then, to walk with Jesus hand in hand, to seek the Lord means that we follow the example of, of Jesus. And I will tell you that verse there, Philippians 2 5, has come back to my mind. The Holy Spirit has had to bring it back time and time and time again. I don't know how many times I've found myself back in that living room as a teenager reading the words again for the first time. You see, if we are walking the Jesus way, the mindset and the attitude and the demeanor of Jesus will come out of our lives. It cannot help but rise to the surface and overflow out of our souls into the world around us. That which is within us will be lived through us. We have just come through a season of serious cooking and baking. Lots of goodies and cookies and treats and sweets. That's probably why so many New Year's resolutions are that we will lose weight in the new year, right? Because we've eaten so much over these last couple of weeks. And recipes are all just a little bit different, aren't they? Recipes where you take the ingredients that are listed and you put them together in just the right order, in just the right amount, and you mix it all together, and then hopefully it will become the treat that it's supposed to be. Well, I'll tell you this. Rana discovered a recipe over this Christmas break, during the season of Advent, and she put that recipe to good use. She found it in a cookbook, and it was a pound cake 
recipe. And after eating two of those pound cakes together over the Christmas holiday, we have come to discover why they're called pound cakes, because it simply just packs the pounds on. But Ronald was nervous to try baking a pound cake for the first time. In fact, a family member had even said, I've always been a little scared to try to bake a pound cake because it can be pretty difficult. But anyway, Ronna found this recipe. She found it. She put the list of ingredients together. She began measuring out and sifting and stirring and putting it all together. And once it, all the ingredients were measured out and mixed well, she then poured it all into a bunt cake pan. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. In order for that pound cake to come out the way it should, all the ingredients must be poured out. You cannot leave them sitting in the mixing bowl. Once everything had been put together, it all had to be poured out. Philippians 2, here. Paul, we don't know whether or not this hymn, as we've come to call it, was set to music in the early church like we would typically think of a hymn. We don't know if it is original with the Apostle Paul or if he picked it up from another congregation, much like the Christ hymn in Colossians 1 that we examined together last week, but it appears that this is a hymn that the Philippian congregation knows about. They must have been familiar with it somehow in order for Paul to use it the way he does in this writing, and it fits perfectly describing the attitude the mindset, and the demeanor of Christ Jesus himself. And what is that attitude and demeanor and mindset of Christ Jesus? 15-year-old Andrew wanted and needed to know it, and 39-year-old Andrew wants it and needs to know it as well. The key to it all is humility. Humility, that's a characteristic that seems to be in short supply these days. It is the practice of thinking modestly of ourselves and considering others ahead of ourselves. There has never been a clearer picture of humility, true, consistent, and constant humility than that of Jesus. If there was ever anyone who had a right to boast about stature or position, it was Jesus, was it not? I mean, consider it. Equal with God, of the same substance as the Holy One, the fullness of the invisible God, as Paul says, in the other Christ hymn in Colossians? If there was ever anyone who could have been full of pomp and pride, it was Jesus. But all of that was poured out. It was all given up. It didn't stay where it originated. It was not exploited. It was not taken advantage of. In fact, the sharpest and clearest picture of this is found in the Gospels themselves. When Jesus is dying a humiliating death and an atoning death, there he hangs on the cruel Roman cross, baking in the Middle Eastern sun and hearing the taunts of those on the ground And those to his side. These taunts, mockings, if you will, sounded like this. He saved others. 
And now let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. If you are the king of the Jews, Jesus, then save yourself. And maybe the starkest taunt of all coming from one who was dying a criminal's death. Aren't you the Christ, the man says? Save yourself and us could have saved himself from all of that. He could have avoided it. Remember, as he prayed in the garden just hours before, Lord, if there is another way, let the cup pass from my hand. But he didn't. Instead, he was obedient. He was obedient all the way through life, through every aspect of life, submitting himself unto God and giving himself for us. Some have even suggested that here on the cross, Christ ceased to be God as if there's some kind of break between the Father and the Son, but that is far from the truth, my friends. For on the cross, we see the full extent of, embodiment and enthronement of the love of God. The divinity of Christ is seen most clearly as the crucified and resurrected one. For without the cross, there is no resurrection. Death is not swallowed in life unless death is tackled by life. As Ralph Martin, New Testament scholar, notes, Jesus brought divine form into focus with a human face. You know, death is truly a humbling experience. And death is no respecter of person. Everyone dies. Everyone. You and me. And if you have ever been present with one who has just drawn their final breath, you'll know just how humbling it really is. But it is only in dying in Christ that we are born to new life. That is because of the obedience of Christ all the way to the end and beyond. In these verses, here in Philippians 2, there is a directional movement, if you will. Jesus pours himself out all the way to the very bottom of human existence, all the way to death. He is poured out and then is exalted and brought upward. You see, the story of Jesus is not finished with the death of Jesus. Death is the bottom, but thanks be to God, it's not the end. Amen? Thanks be to God, it is not the end. There is another stanza, if you will, in this hymn. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. There is something about the name of Jesus, my friends. Though it was a common name in first century Judaism, and there are some variants and forms of it around today, there is only one Jesus of Nazareth, the God-man who stepped into the pages of human history and whose death led to resurrection in order to bring light and life into a world filled with the scars of darkness and death. And the name of Jesus calls every person to a response. We must do business with Jesus. And the first Sunday of the new year is a perfect time To do it, we must decide what we will do with him. Paul describes here the response that is both now and not yet. That every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. 
that at the name of Jesus every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We must decide what we will do with him. If we want to know God, we must come to Jesus. If we come to Jesus, we must bow before him as Lord and God. You remember that scene at the end of the Gospel of John where Thomas the doubter has said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand, unless I can put my hand in his side, I cannot believe that he is risen from the dead. And then Jesus appears. You remember this, I hope. And when Jesus appears and he says, here, Thomas, what does Thomas do? He falls down before the living Christ and says, my Lord, And my God, the one we come to know as Elohim, as Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Roy, Emmanuel, he is Christ the Lord. And we fall before him, bow before him as the Lord of our lives And the Lord's prayer then becomes the prayer of our lives. It becomes the prayer of following Jesus. For to pray the Lord's prayer means that we are trusting our Father in heaven and committing our lives to bowing before him. Recently, I heard a story from a friend as he recounted about a wedding gift. He and his wife had received many, many years ago. He said they received a cookbook together. Now, it's pretty common and popular for newly married couples to be given a cookbook as a wedding gift. Rana and I received several when we were married, but my friend shared. He shared that this cookbook was different from any other cookbook he'd ever seen before or since Because it was a collection of recipes from both sides of the family. Important and wonderful recipes from both he and his wife and their respective sides of the family. It had in it, he said, his mother's spaghetti recipe and his mother-in-law's banana pudding. And then... A friend said, as wonderful as that gift was, the information entrusted to us in those amazing recipes never cooked a meal for us. The family members who contributed didn't force us to prepare a dish. A gift came to us and we welcomed it and embraced that gift in a very practical way and we prepared meals and dishes in keeping with those recipes. The recipe was there but it had to be put to use. Taking the ingredients and pouring them out and following the recipe to then share it with others. And then my friend said that it was only when the recipe was put to use that they saw any kind of result. And the result, be it spaghetti or banana pudding, became an opportunity to share that goodness with other people. Jesus has offered to us the recipe for knowing God and trusting God and following God. And the Lord's Prayer is that structure in our prayer life. And the Lord's Prayer becomes the recipe for how we follow and how we live. And the first ingredient at the top of the list is to fall at the feet of Jesus and say, My Lord and my God as we gaze into the future and behold a new year and new beginnings, we must do so on our knees before our Lord and our God. There is no better place to start the new year than coming before Christ, the humble and exalted one. There is no better way to begin the new year than to coming to him on our knees and confessing you are our only hope. Tell me about God. 
she said. What is God like? That was the desire of her heart that evening. That should be the desire of our hearts every day, all day, and all year. Together, let's bow before Christ to know God more. The way to know is to come before God in humility, giving ourselves over to the presence of the one who became one of us, that we may be one with him. Jesus, what a beautiful name. Will you pray with me? It is humbling, O oh God, to know that you call us by name and that we call you our Father. We come this day bowing before you as Lord and God, knowing full well the depth of our need for you and asking your Holy Spirit to stir and swell among us to draw us ever closer to you. We pray that as we draw closer to you, we will draw closer to one another and we will invite others to come along, to come to life and to walk in the light of your presence. O oh God, giver of life, we are humbly grateful to know you and to follow you. And now as Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jimmy and our musicians are coming to lead us in our hymn of commitment, More Like Jesus Would I Be. You will find the words printed in your worship bulletin. You will also find them on the screen before you. May this be our hymn of commitment that we all may be more like Jesus. As we begin this new year, let us fall before him in humility, calling him Lord and God. Let's sing together. Dear God, thank you so much for reminding us once again our need of you. 
Thank you for feeding our souls, Father. Thank you for the privilege of giving back to you the tithe and offerings, which in fact belong to you. Father, thank you for providing for us beyond our needs. Give us wisdom. Oh, Father, give us wisdom. Give us your mind to use these offerings and these ties according to your will and also to further your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hasn't it been good to worship with those in the house of the Lord this day to be united in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father? What a wonderful, wonderful privilege it is to be united in the power and the presence of the three in one. Thank you for worshiping with us this day here at Viewmont Baptist. We're delighted and pray that you have been encouraged and strengthened and challenged to live the life that God's calling you to live, to live out your calling and to follow Jesus in every way. Certainly it is good for us to be together. Just a quick reminder about our schedule here at Viewmont. We have paused our gathered in-person worship here at Viewmont because of the increase of COVID-19 in our immediate community. Uh, so we, we've paused that in-person gathering right now and we'll be relying on our presence on WHKY and streaming live on YouTube each week. Uh, so please continue to pray uh, for those being affected by COVID-19. We have asked our congregation to pray every morning and evening at 8 o'clock for the Holy Spirit to bring hope, healing, and peace to our world, our nation, and our community. And we need that now more than ever. So certainly it is good to begin the new year together worshiping and bowing before Almighty God. Will you join me for our benediction? And now as we go forth from this holy house into God's blessed earth, may we find our journey of worship of the eternal, living and loving God to be only just beginning. Together we tread the soil of the ordinary, but may we leave the mark of the holy as those who are being transformed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And together we go as the church in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.